got one that can see. Which was written by highly respected Masonic authorities, which describes the secret doctrine of the Masonic Lodge. I am not a Masonic authority and want to make that clear. But the authors selected include men who are widely acclaimed as Masonic authorities. The material consists of photographs or close-ups of Masonic books with critical text underlined. Whenever a new book is introduced, I will show the cover and or the title page and identify the author. From that point on, I will just show the pages of interest. The quotes are shown in context. I will attempt to let the Masonic authors inform us about the secret doctrine in their own words, and from time to time, I'll ask questions which will be answered by the writings of these highly respected Masons. I will summarize what they have said and try to draw conclusions from it. Before we start discussing the secret doctrine, I want to explain some things about the structure of Freemasonry. This photograph is from the October 8, 1956 issue of Life magazine. That particular issue had a multiple page full color spread showcasing Freemasonry. The Lodge cooperated fully with the magazine. The article was a tremendous public relations piece for them. Each step in this structure represents a degree of Freemasonry. The first three steps at the base represent the Blue Lodge. The Blue Lodge consists of the degrees of Entered Apprentice, Fellowcraft, and Master Mason. Every Mason is a member of a Blue Lodge. Once a man has attained the Master Mason degree, which might take about 90 days, he is eligible to join either the York Rite or the Scottish Rite or both. The steps on the right side represent the 10 named degrees of the York Rite. The first step is the Mark Master degree. The top degree is the Knights Templar degree. The steps on the left side represent the numbered degrees of the Scottish Rite. The degrees are numbered from 4 to 33. The 33rd degree is an honorary degree which is conveyed only to those who have given much to the Scottish Rite. Additionally, some men are named to the 33rd degree because it would be of benefit to the Lodge to be identified with them. A few examples are Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, Gerald Ford, and Ernest Borgnine. The 32nd degree is the highest degree for which a man can make application. If anyone applies for the 33rd, they are automatically disqualified. After a man has the 32nd degree in the Scottish Rite, or the Knights Templar degree of the York Rite, he is eligible to join the Shrine. The full name of the Shrine is the Ancient Arabic Order, Nobles of the Mystic Shrine, and they're represented right here. They are the group which puts on the Shrine Circus and has the burn centers. There are many other Masonic bodies, such as D. Malay, that's an organization for young men, Rainbow Girls, an organization for young girls, Job's Daughters, an organization for older girls, and then the Eastern Star for the wives and daughters of Masons. There are well over a hundred different appendant Masonic bodies. We will deal with only the most common ones. Who is the highest authority in Freemasonry? That is the first question we must ask if we are to discover the truth about Freemasonry. In order to ensure accuracy, we must make sure that we consider the materials written by men who are recognized as authorities. This is the building which houses the Grand Lodge of Indiana. Anything that occurs in any Blue Lodge in Indiana is under the auspices of this body. According to the Indiana Monitor, there are 49 Grand Lodges, one for each of the 48 continental states and one for the District of Columbia. Alaska is under the jurisdiction of Washington. Hawaii is under the jurisdiction of California. The head of the Grand Lodge is called the Grand Master. The head of each Blue Lodge is called the Worshipful Master. The Worshipful Master has absolute control of what goes on in his lodge. If he is thought to be guilty of Masonic misconduct, 
A member may appeal to the Grand Lodge. However, a lodge may not try its own master. The Grand Lodge is the highest authority. Only the Grand Lodge has the authority to issue charters for new lodges, and only they can pull a charter. Every Mason belongs to a Blue Lodge. What is the true nature of the Masonic Lodge? What type of an organization is it? Many people, in fact most people, believe that the Masonic Lodge is a social or a fraternal organization. In order to discover the true nature of the Lodge, we are going to look at a Declaration of Principles adopted by the Grand Lodge of Indiana. This is the Indiana Blue Book of Masonic Law. We can see that it's adopted by the Grand Lodge Free and Accepted Masons of the State of Indiana. And when we look at the bottom of the page, we'll notice that it's published by the authority of the Grand Lodge of Indiana. There is no higher authority. This is a book of Masonic Law. It was published by the Grand Lodge to regulate the operation of the Blue Lodges, and other states have similar books. Notice at the bottom that this is published by the authority of the Grand Lodge Free and Accepted Masons of the State of Indiana, and it's dated 1953. This is page five of the Indiana Blue Book of Masonic Law. They list a declaration of principles of the most worshipful Grand Lodge of free and accepted Masons of the state of Indiana. And this was adopted in 1939 and revised in May 18, 1949. Now this same declaration of principles is found in the, the books of other lodges. Uh, one, for example, would be the uh, Grand Lodge of Georgia uses the same declaration of principles. So it's representative of uh, the typical Masonic organization in any state. We notice that Freemasonry is a charitable, benevolent, educational, and religious society. Its only secrets are in its methods of recognition and of symbolic instruction. We're going to see that that last statement is not really true. Further down on page five, they state, it is a social organization only so far as it furnishes additional inducement that men may forgather in numbers, thereby providing more material for its primary work of education, of worship, and of charity. Please notice that the primary work of the Lodge is education, worship, and charity. That definition sounds like a reasonable definition for a church, doesn't it? The social nature of the Lodge is secondary, just as it is in a church. This is page 75 of the Indiana Blue Book of Masonic Law. On page 75, the Blue Book tells us that the Indiana Monitor and Freemason's Guide is accepted by the Grand Lodge of Indiana as the official monitor. Each lodge is required to present a copy to each of its newly raised Master Masons at the conclusion of the Master Mason degree work. This is a copy of the Indiana Monitor and Freemason's Guide. It's a small book which will fit in a shirt pocket. It was donated by a man who renounced Freemasonry after he became aware of some of the material that you're going to see. This monitor was presented to him in 1961. This is the title page of the Indiana Monitor and Freemason's Guide. And we notice down at the bottom that it is published by the authority of the most worshipful Grand Lodge of free and accepted Masons of the state of Indiana. It is a 1959 copy, and it has the seal of the Grand Lodge. On page 35 of the Indiana Monitor and Freemasons Guide, we find the same declaration of principles that was in the Indiana Blue Book of Masonic Law. And we see they write again, it is a social organization only so far as it furnishes additional inducement that men may forgather in numbers, thereby providing more material for its primary work of education, of worship, and of charity. We see that each man raised to Master Mason in Indiana is told that the purpose of the Lodge is education, worship, and charity. The fine print at the bottom explains the Declaration of Principles is included in the monitor to refute willful misrepresentation. 
The second line that's underlined in red says, it impresses upon its members the principles of personal righteousness and personal responsibility. At this point, we run into just a bit of a problem because the Bible states, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. The Lost Keys of Freemasonry is highly regarded by Masons and Masonic authorities. Later we will see an endorsement of it. Manley Palmer Hall just died in 1990, and he was a highly respected Masonic author and lecturer. Keep in mind that we're still trying to find out the true nature of the Lodge. This is the title page for the Lost Keys of Freemasonry. It's by Manley Palmer Hall. We notice he's also the author of Masonic, Hermetic, Kabbalistic, and Rosicrucian Symbolical Philosophy. And we're going to see that book later. Notice down at the bottom that it is published by the McCoy Publishing and Masonic Supply Company. That's the leading Masonic publisher and supplier. This is page 19 of the Lost Keys of Freemasonry. And I want to show you Hall's opinion of the Lodge. He says the Masonic Order is not a mere social organization, but is composed of all those who have banded themselves together to learn and apply the principles of mysticism and the occult rites. This sign is on the front of a Prince Hall Masonic Temple. That's the Black Lodge. Notice that the word temple appears on the sign of this lodge. The sign doesn't say Masonic Clubhouse or Masonic Social Hall, but rather Masonic Temple. This is the entrance to the Grand Lodge of Indiana. Notice above the door, the sign Masonic Temple. Even the Grand Lodge entrance acknowledges that the building is a temple. Well, we must conclude that the Masonic Lodge is not a social organization. We are forced to accept this because Masonic authorities have made it clear from their writings. What is the purpose of the Masonic Lodge? This is the great teachings of masonry by Henry L. Haywood. Haywood is a noted Masonic historian from the Lodge of Iowa. He gives us a rather descriptive purpose statement. Haywood is a widely respected Masonic author. He is quoted in the footnotes of the Indiana Monitor and Freemason's Guide, in fact. This is the title page for the great teachings of masonry by Haywood. And we note at the bottom that it also is published by the McCoy Publishing and Masonic Supply Company. This is chapter 33. It's in the chapter on the meaning of initiation and secrecy. Now we're going to see what Haywood says about the purpose of the Lodge. He says the fraternity itself exists in order to keep fixed on a man a certain set of influences and in order to bring about certain changes in the world, etc. Its secrecy is the means to that end and helps to make such a purpose possible. That really doesn't sound too bad, does it? Well, we'll come back to this quote later. After the secret doctrine is fully understood, the words of Haywood will take on an ominous meaning. At this point, however, we don't understand them. The problem is we don't have a Masonic paradigm. A paradigm is a model pattern or example which explains our understanding of something. We attempt to match new situations with one of our existing paradigms. We are often limited in our understanding when we assume that one of our existing paradigms matches with the reality of something new. As an example, suppose that you have never seen or heard of an airplane. You've ridden in cars and on trains, but for some reason you've not been exposed to the idea of manned flight. Now suppose someone were to get you into a small plane, say a Cessna 150. The pilot starts the engine and begins down the runway. The plane goes faster and faster towards the end of the runway. You may be impressed with the speed and even alarmed if you see the end of the runway fast approaching, but you wouldn't expect that you're about to leave the ground. All you have to model your understanding on is your experience with cars and trains. You are limited by your paradigms. Once the plane leaves the ground, you develop a new paradigm very quickly. The same is true about the material we are looking at here. 
Don't assume that what you are reading was written by Christians. Masonic writers do not have an orthodox paradigm of Jesus, God, Satan, salvation, baptism, deity, etc. They intentionally clothe their writings in Christian terminology in order that Christians will be limited by their paradigms. In order to understand the nature of Freemasonry, we have to look at Masonic writings from the perspective of someone who does not believe that Jesus is the only Son of God. When reading the Masonic quotes, try to switch paradigms and see how the meanings change. What is the most important symbol of Freemasonry? And what is the meaning of that symbol? This is page 38 of the Indiana Masonic Monitor. It's also known as the Indiana Monitor and Freemason's Guide. We're going to look down at the bottom of the page. It says, The Legend of the Third Degree. This is the most important and significant of the legendary symbols of Freemasonry. It has descended from age to age by oral tradition and has been preserved in every Masonic rite practiced in any country or language with no essential alteration. So we have a document from the Grand Lodge of Indiana that clearly states that the legend of the third degree is the most important symbol of Freemasonry. There's more information on the legend of the third degree and on page 144 of the Indiana Masonic Monitor. Let's look again at the bottom of the page. And they write, it was the single object of all the ancient rites and mysteries practiced in the very bosom of pagan darkness to teach the immortality of the soul. This is still the great design of the third degree of masonry. The top of the next page. This is the scope and aim of its ritual. By its legend and all its ritual, it is implied that we have been redeemed from the death of sin and the sepulcher of pollution. Now this is a book that's given to each and every Master Mason that's raised to Master Mason in the state of Indiana. Please pay careful attention. They tell each Master Mason that by its legend and all its ritual, it is implied that we have been redeemed from the death of sin and the sepulcher of pollution. Anything which is said to save a man from the death of sin constitutes a plan of salvation. I want to show you where that verbiage came from. Much of we, what we've just seen was originally written by Dr. Albert Mackey, a man who is acknowledged worldwide as one of Masonry's most respected authors. Here's the title page for a manual of the Lodge, or Monitorial Instructions. This book was published in 1862, however it is still in use today. The Grand Lodge of South Carolina has included the book in its entirety in their monitor, which is known as the Iman Reason. We're going to look at page 96 of Manual of the Lodge, but first of all I want to show you that it was indeed written by Dr. Albert G. Mackey, M.D. This is page 96 of Manual of the Lodge. The text we're interested in is in the center and at the bottom of the page. And we read, it was the single object of all the ancient rites and mysteries practiced in the very bosom of pagan darkness, shining as a solitary beacon in all that surrounding gloom and cheering the philosopher in his weary pilgrimage of life to teach the immortality of the soul. This is still the great design of the third degree of masonry. This is the scope and aim of its ritual. By its legend and all its ritual, it is implied that we have been redeemed from the death of sin and the sepulcher of pollution. Now down a little further on the page at the bottom, Mackey writes, The important design of the degree is to symbolize the great doctrines of the resurrection of the body and the immortality of the soul. The Master Mason represents a man saved from the grave of iniquity and raised to the faith of salvation. Clearly what we're talking about here is a plan of salvation. Can the nature of Freemasonry be accurately understood without an understanding of the secret doctrine? Let's see what the Masonic authors say. Swinburne Clymer wrote The Mysticism of Masonry. 
Clymer is another of the medical doctors which are well-known Masonic authorities. This book was written sometime before 1924. This is page 48 of the mysticism of masonry. And Clymer writes in the center of the page, the secret doctrine is the complete philosophy of Masonic symbolism. Clymer's statement is accurate. The true nature of the Masonic Lodge cannot be understood without having an understanding of the secret doctrine. Masonic author George Steinmetz wrote The Lost Word, Its Hidden Meaning. The book was published in 1953 by the McCoy Masonic Publishing and Supply Company, the leading Masonic publisher. And we can see that is the fact down at the bottom. George Steinmetz has written a series of books which end with the phrase, Its Hidden Meaning. We see Freemasonry, The Hidden Meaning, The Royal Arts, The Hidden Meaning, in the lost word, its hidden meaning, he says it was written with the primary purpose of delving into the secret doctrine in Freemasonry. On page 10, chapter 2 is titled, The Secret Doctrine. We find the following. The secret doctrine, being the real secret of Freemasonry, is not divulged even to the candidate. There is no machinery set up in the ritual for the purpose and the secret doctrine itself is not even acknowledged to exist. We're looking at page 11, the next page, and a little further down, Steinmetz writes, officially, the ritual is all that there is, and no grand lodge will go beyond that fact and attempt to define the teachings of masonry, nor will any grand lodge, to my knowledge, admit the existence of the secret doctrine which is so openly discussed and written about by Masonic students and authorities on Masonic symbolism. Picking it up again on page 12 at the bottom, we read the secret doctrine in Freemasonry cannot be too strongly stressed. Firstly, because there are those in the order who in their lack of knowledge claim that it does not exist. Secondly, because the seeking Mason can gain no further light than is shed by the ritual itself until he starts his quest for the real secrets of the hidden mysteries of Freemasonry, and they are found within the secret doctrine. What does the Grand Lodge of Indiana do to encourage the new Master Mason to discover the secret doctrine? Remember that each man that's raised a Master Mason in the state of Indiana is given a copy of the Indiana Monitor and Freemason's Guide, which is also known as the Indiana Masonic Monitor. On page 124, we find the following text. In the ceremonies of making a Mason, we do not attempt to do more than to indicate the pathway to Masonic knowledge. The brother must pursue the journey or complete the structure for himself by reading and reflection. Clearly, the Grand Lodge of Indiana tells New Masons that they are not being given all of the facts about Freemasonry, but must read and reflect to obtain a true understanding. Which books would a Mason read to learn about Freemasonry? Obviously, those written by Masonic authors. Do all Grand Lodges point the way to the secret doctrine in the same manner? Well, we're going to see that there are variations, slight variations from state to state, but in all cases they point the new Mason to Masonic books to learn more about Freemasonry. Here are several Masonic monitors. We don't have time to go through all of these, but this is the one for the Lodge of West Virginia. This is the Masonic Manual and Code. That's uh, the Peach State, uh, Georgia. This is the I'm in Reason. This is the one that has Manual of the Lodge reproduced in its entirety, and I'll show you that here real quick. You can see that uh, that does have Manual of the Lodge there, and it reproduces the entire book in its uh, monitor of South Carolina. Then we've got the monitor from North Carolina. It's much smaller. We've got the Kentucky monitor. That's from the Bluegrass State. We have the Michigan Monitor and Ceremonies. And then the Manual of Dayton Lodge number 147. 
There's slight variations in all of these monitors, and they have various names. I want to spend just a little bit of time with the Masonic textbook for, for the use of the Lodges of West Virginia. Now, here's the title page, and we see that uh, it is for use in the Lodges under the jurisdiction of the most worshipful Grand Lodge of free and accepted Masons of the state of West Virginia. And we see down at the bottom that it's published by the Grand Lodge, and it's dated 1919. Now, this particular copy was given to a man in 1927. This is page 15 of the Masonic textbook for West Virginia, and we read, The Masonic student of the future may, however, by careful study through its symbolism, discover and bring to light many of its lost characteristics features now hidden in the letter of its history and lessons as portrayed in the ancient manuscripts and repeated by Dr. Anderson. They are saying that by careful study, more can be learned. Whose books would they have you study? Well, no doubt, books written by Masonic authors. Would they care to recommend a few? Well, yes, they would. We read on page 25, Brother Albert Pike, one of the most illustrious Masons in all the ages, and who was an acknowledged authority upon all Masonic questions, so they're lifting up Albert Pike as an acknowledged authority on all Masonic questions. Pike's writings. Who else would they recommend? Well, on page 19, they list, uh, lift up Brother Albert G. Mackey of South Carolina. Now, we've already seen Mackey's Manual of the Lodge. We'll see more of his writings also. On page 16, they lift up a few more Masonic authors. Hunan. The first name on that line, I'd like you to remember, we're going to see some material from him in the second part. Gould, Drummond, and Albert Pike again. We're going to spend a little bit of time with the Kentucky Monitor also. This is the title page, and we can see at the bottom that it is arranged by Henry Pirtle, who was a past master. That means a former worshipful master. Notice at the bottom it's copyrighted 1921 by the Standard Publishing Company. Since it's not published directly by the Grand Lodge of Kentucky, uh, they can say just a bit more about uh, things that are to be kept secret than some of the other monitors do. Like the Indiana monitor, the Kentucky monitor borrows much of its verbiage from books written by Masonic authorities, and those books and authors are listed in footnotes. I want to quickly show you some of those footnotes. Here on page XIV in the preface, they list morals and dogma in the footnotes. We've got Albert G. Mackey, the Encyclopedia of Masonry, listed in the footnotes on page XVI. And then on page XX, they've got Joseph Fort Newton, the builders, uh, listed in the footnotes. This is the preface, which is entitled The Spirit of Masonry. Let's look a little bit about the purpose of this publication. The purpose and publication of the Kentucky Monitor has been to collect and present to the Lodge officers and interested brethren some of those comments which have been made by qualified brethren is such amplification of some portions of our ceremonies not otherwise sufficiently explained. All matter here included has been found in print elsewhere in proper sources. And we're, we've already seen some of those proper sources. For example, Manual of the Lodge by Albert Mackey is widely quoted. Morals and Dogma is another one of those authoritative sources. The Encyclopedia of Freemasonry is another one. Uh, the Builders by Joseph Fort Newton, which are uh, in, all in the uh, footnotes, are all qualified sources. In the back of the Kentucky Monitor is a 41-page index, which helps us find many things in the, in the Monitor. One entry is on the secret doctrine. You notice there's 17 pages that are listed as having information on the secret doctrine. Here's a typical passage about the secret doctrine found in the Kentucky Monitor. This, in short, is a synopsis of the story that Masonry attempts to tell. The secret doctrine completed from the wisdom of the ancient East. Page 20, we have another entry for the secret doctrine, and it reads, So, my brother, masonry teaches by allegories and symbols 
and it is your part to extract from them the truths that will be of service to you in the building of an upright Masonic character. Again, what they're saying is that there is more to learn. This is Masonic Lodge Methods by L.B. Blakemore. It contains suggestions about the proper use of the Lodge Library and has a good bibliography in the back of it. We see from the flap that Blakemore is a past Grand Master of Ohio. That means he was head of the Grand Lodge. We're going to take a look at some text on page 43 at the bottom. Blakemore writes, It is suggested that when a candidate has been raised, and while he is still in the master's care, the lodge librarian, or the chaplain, or the master himself should address him somewhat as follows. I herewith present you with a Masonic book which I have borrowed for you from our Lodge Library or other Masonic Library. You will read it and return it and secure another one and so continue your search for more light in Masonry. This is impressive and figures in the candidate's mind as part of his initiation and starts him out on a search for more Masonic light and information. The book presented should be an interesting one carefully selected with a view to his ability to appreciate it. So we see that the Lodge Library and the Masonic books that are contained in them plays a very important part in educating the new Master Mason about the deeper meanings of Masonry. The secret doctrine is well documented in Masonic libraries. This library is at the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C. Even this room is not large enough to hold all of the Masonic books which have been written. The many rooms at the House of the Temple hold over 200,000 volumes. A typical lodge would not have a library which would compare with this room alone. Some small lodges do not have a library at all, but all grand lodges do. This is the catalog of the McCoy Publishing and Masonic Supply Company the leading Masonic publisher. This page from McCoy's catalog shows that many Grand Lodges present a copy of the builders to each man who is raised to Master Mason. Raised is used in the sense of raised from the dead. We'll cover this later. We've already seen the builders in the footnotes of the Kentucky Monitor. This is a copy of the builders by Joseph Fort Newton. I want you to notice the book plate that's on the inside. It says, Presented to William E. Borrowman on being raised to the sublime degree of Master Mason this 30th day of October, 1916. And it was presented by Lafayette Lodge, number 265, Free and Accepted Masons in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And it's signed by the Worshipful Master. So we have evidence here that, in fact, many lodges do present copies of the builders to Master Masons when they're raised to the degree of Master Mason. Masonic books are vital to educating Master Masons about the secret doctrine. However, they present a bit of a dilemma for the Lodge when they fall into the wrong hands. This book was written by Albert Pike. He wrote the rituals of the Scottish Rite, and this book was written for the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree and published by its authority. Now, we're down further on the page, we see that this is an esoteric book. They claim for Scottish Rite use only, and is to be returned upon withdrawal or death of the recipient. So this is the book that they want to get back so that it doesn't fall into the wrong hands. Now, we know from the Kentucky Monitor, the footnotes, that Morals and Dogma is also used in the Blue Lodge. What is the reaction of the Lodge when Masonic books fall into the hands of someone like a fundamentalist Christian? First of all, what is a fundamentalist Christian? Well, a simple definition would be someone who believes the fundamentals of the Christian faith. Things like the virgin birth of Jesus, the fact that Jesus is God, he took upon himself the form of a man, and was without sin. He was crucified, buried, and then raised from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he is coming back. Those sorts of things. This issue of the Scottish Rite Journal has a good example of typical Masonic methods which are used when someone stumbles onto writings which reveal things they don't want known. The article we're interested in is Albert Pike, Debitor Credit. 
It's written by C. Fred Kleinkinect, who's the sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction. It starts on page four and it runs through page six. We read at the top of page four, I recently heard an outspoken Scottish Rite brother refer to Albert Pike as a debit to our order. Pike, he asserted, in no way benefits the contemporary Scottish Rite. In contrast, Pike's epic work, Morals and Dogma, he thinks, weakens our every Masonic action and causes members to leave our ranks. Sadly, on the surface at least, he is right. Anti-Masonic writers, especially fundamentalists of every stripe, delight in pulling quotations out of context from Morals and Dogma. The first Masonic tactic we see here is to claim that the quotes are taken out of context. This is a very common tactic. The problem of taking something out of context is that the meaning can be misunderstood when writing is not shown in its surroundings. But really, to examine the full context of something, you often have to consider not only the immediate surroundings, but other chapters of a book as well. Sometimes you have to examine other books written by the author, and often books written by his contemporaries, and possibly even examine historical writings. For example, in order to fully understand a given passage in the book of Luke, you have to read it in the context of the verses before and after it. You also have to consider the previous and following chapters. You might have to refer to one of the other gospel accounts or the book of Acts to get the full picture. You might have to refer to the Old Testament prophets also. Often we were able to take a passage out of its surroundings and the meaning does not change. It is still taken out of context, but it is not a problem. The claim that something is taken out of context often is meant to imply that the person who used the quote is trying to intentionally deceive. Let's examine this article written by Fred Kleinkinect in context. Fred is the highest ranking member of the Southern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite. On the bottom of page four, we see his photograph and I'm going to zoom in on that so you can get a little better look at his headdress. Can you see the emblem on his head covering? It has a series of vertical and horizontal lines on it. Now we will see a better picture of Fred later on. This is page six of the same article, Albert Pike, Debit or Credit. And here's a second tactic which is demonstrated. It must be understood that morals and dogma is an expression of Pike's personal opinions. The book does not represent official Scottish Rite philosophy. The tactic is simply to state that the book expresses the opinion of the writer only. We don't believe or hold to those things. That book is not authoritative and that man is generally not accepted as an authority on Freemasonry. Now let's look at the context. Down at the bottom we read, correctly understood, Albert Pike's morals and dogma provides our brethren a stimulus to thought, a source of inspiration, and even an aid to Scottish Rite growth. Pike's great work is not the book of an hour, a decade, or a century. It is a book for all time. Abandoned morals and dogma? Never. The book disclaimed is often the most useful after all. So we see that Fred is talking out of both sides of his mouth here. The Scottish Rite will never abandon morals and dogma. We saw on the title page that morals and dogma was published by the authority of the 33rd degree. Let's continue looking at the context. Notice the symbol to the left of Fred's signature. That is the same symbol which he wears on his headpiece. It is known as the signal of Baphomet or Baphomet. We will come back to this element of context later when we introduce Baphomet. Looking at the top of the page again, notice that Fred says, the book does not represent official Scottish Rite philosophy. This is the title page of a book called A Bridge to Light, written by Rex Hutchins. And we notice that the foreword is written by C. Fred Kleinkinect, the Sovereign Grant Commander, and it's published by the Supreme Council of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry Southern Jurisdiction in 1988. Well, let's see what Fred writes in the foreword. Fred writes, the apex of our teachings 
has been the rituals of our degrees and morals and dogma written by our beloved Sovereign Grand Commander, Albert Pike. Now, just a moment ago, I showed KleinConnect writing that the book does not represent official Scottish Rite philosophy when he was speaking of morals and dogma. So here's another Masonic tactic. They lie. There is ample evidence at this time to support the following. The Masonic Lodge is not a social organization. The Masonic Lodge has a plan of salvation. The Masonic Lodge has a secret doctrine. And we cannot understand Freemasonry without understanding the secret doctrine. What is the Masonic plan of salvation and how does it tie into the secret doctrine? We previously learned from the Indiana Monitor that the legend of the third degree was the most important symbol of Freemasonry and we need to understand it before we can have a complete understanding of the secret doctrine. The lost word and the rediscovery of it is a central theme in Masonic ritual. The setting for the legend is the building of Solomon's temple just before completion. For working on the temple, the workmen are to receive the secrets of a master mason which will entitle them to the wages of a master. Three of the men cannot wait to obtain the secrets. During the ritual of the third degree, each man is required to portray Hiram Abiff. Hiram is accosted by three ruffians, Jubala, Jubalo, and Jubalum, who are demanding that he reveal to them the secrets of a master mason. Hiram is a righteous individual. He will not reveal the secrets to them until the proper time and place and then only in the presence of Hiram, king of Tyre, and Solomon, king of Israel. The first ruffian fails to get the word from Hiram of If. The second ruffian demands, give me the master's word or I will take your life in a moment. The third ruffian actually does take the life of Hiram. He is unjustly murdered. When he died, the word was lost because it could not be mentioned except in the presence of the two Hirams and Solomon. Hiram of Biff is then buried. After the grave is located and the body confirmed to be that of the Grand Master, Hiram of Biff, King Solomon, who is portrayed by the Worshipful Master, declares that the Master's word has been lost. He declares that the first word spoken after the body is raised will be adopted for the regulation of the Master's lodges until future generations shall find the right word. Hiram of Biff is then raised from the dead by the strong grip of the lion's paw of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. The first word spoken by Hiram Abiff after being raised from the dead was maha bone. That is the substitute for the lost word. Hiram Abiff is a righteous individual who is unjustly murdered, buried, and then raised from the dead. Look at the way Hiram is laying. He has his arms outstretched and his palms up. Notice the crown from his head. What is the meaning of this ritual? Could this be a mockery of the death, the burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior? Remember, this is the most important symbol of Freemasonry, is the legend of the third degree. This small book is called The Master Mason. It's a training material for the Lodge. It says at the top for the candidate and it's book number four in a series. The first three books are called On the Threshold. Now, I've got a copy of this book that's published by the Indiana Grand Lodge and also another one that's published by the authority of the North Carolina Grand Lodge. So this book is used widely. It's not just used by one state. This is the title page for the Master Mason and we can see in fact it is authorized by the Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons of Indiana. Now, this makes it an authoritative book in the state of Indiana. It's compiled by the Committee on Masonic Education. This is the foreword, which begins on page two. It is safe to say that among the countless thousands who have in the past been raised to the sublime degree of Master Mason, no one of them realized at the time the full implications of the ceremony. This clearly would be impossible. Yet it is vitally important that the deeper meanings of this degree be understood if one is to become a Master Mason in fact as well as in name. 
Now they're saying here that a man cannot be a Master Mason in fact until he understands the deeper meanings of this ritual or this degree. Now how would you find out the deeper meanings? Well, they reveal that the literature of masonry in all its many phases is within your reach and your worshipful master or secretary can give you particulars. Picking it up again on page three in the center of the page, we read the master or secretary can give you particulars. Picking it up again on page three in the center of the page, we read your enjoyment of Freemasonry its value to you in your future life, your contribution to the fulfillment of its great mission will be in direct proportion to your understanding of its secrets, which, if you will recall the degree through which you have just passed, you do not yet have, and which can only be gained by your own endeavors and the assistance of your brethren. Now, which brethren would they turn to for assistance? At the bottom of the page, they write again, much has been written about Freemasonry. Probably your own lodge possesses a library of books telling of the history of Freemasonry and treating of its philosophy, symbolism, and jurisprudence. These books are at your disposal at all times, and there are many others that you may purchase for study in your own home. There are also many magazines on the subject. So over and over and over again, we see the Grand Lodges pointing the newly raised Master Mason to the Masonic Library or into the Masonic books to find out the meaning of the rituals that they've gone through. Mystic Masonry by J.D. Buck contains a good explanation of the meaning of the legend of the third degree. It was written by another of the medical doctors who happened to be respected Masonic authorities. This book was written before the turn of the century, and it is still in print today. It would not be in print if Masons were not buying it and reading it. Here is a portrait of Dr. Buck. This is the title page. There's another title that this book also goes by, Symbolism of Freemasonry, but the more common title is Mystic Masonry. And we see that it was written by J.D. Buck, who was 32nd degree. We're going to run into the Greek word Christos, which means anointed. It's the word that's used for Christ in the New Testament manuscripts. On page 133, we read about the meaning of the third degree ritual. In the third degree, the candidate impersonates Hiram, who has been shown to be identical with the Christos of the Greeks and with the sun gods of all other nations. The superiority of masonry at this point over all exoteric religions consists in this. All these religions take the symbol for the thing symbolized. Christ was originally like the Father. Now he is made identical with the Father. In deifying Jesus, the whole of humanity is bereft of Christos as an eternal potency within every human soul, a latent Christ in every man. In thus deifying one man, they have orphaned the whole of humanity. On the other hand, masonry in making every candidate personify Hiram has preserved the original teaching, which is the universal glyphic. Few candidates may be aware that Hiram, whom they have represented and personified, is ideally and precisely the same as Christ. Yet this is undoubtedly the case. Now I can hear it now. The Masons are going to deny that this is an accurate interpretation of the legend of the third degree. They're going to say that that man does not speak for Masonry. That's his own personal opinion. So let's take a look at a monitor and see if we can find one that agrees with that interpretation. This is the Kentucky monitor. The preface is the spirit of Masonry. We can see in the underlying text that it is, in fact, the Kentucky monitor. Now I'm going to show you some text that's on page... XIV. The word is all at the bottom. That's the only word that I'm going to read. Then we'll move up to the top of the next page. All believed in a future life to be attained by purification and trials in a state or successive states of reward and punishment and in a mediator or redeemer by whom the evil principle was to be overcome and the supreme deity reconciled to his creatures. The belief was general that he was to be born of a virgin and suffer a painful death. 
The Hindus call him Krishna. The Chinese, some other word. The Persians, some other word. The Chaldeans, some other word. The Egyptians, Horus. Plato, love. The Scandinavians, Balter. The Christians, Jesus. Masons, Hiram. It is interesting that the small hill west of Mount Moriah has been identified as Golgotha or Mount Calvary. So here clearly we see in a Masonic monitor from the state of Kentucky that the Lodge considers Hiram Abiff to be equal with Jesus Christ. So Buck's opinion is in fact supported by the Grand Lodge of Kentucky apparently. This is page 57 of Mystic Masonry. Let's find out just a bit more about the legend of the third degree. Buck writes, Every soul must work out its own salvation and take the kingdom of heaven by force. Salvation by faith and the vicarious atonement were not taught as now interpreted by Jesus, nor are these doctrines taught in the exoteric scriptures. They are latter and ignorant perversions of the original doctrines. In the early churches in the secret doctrine, there was not one Christ for the whole world, but a potential Christ in every man. On page 62, Buck writes, It is far more important that men should strive to become Christ's than that they should believe that Jesus was Christ. If the Christ state can be attained but by one human being during the whole evolution of the race, then the evolution of man is a farce and human perfection an impossibility. But what did Jesus say? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Peter clearly understood this. In Acts 4.10 we find, Be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We need to learn some terminology in order to understand the writings of Masonic authors. Notice that the word Christ has been redefined. It no longer refers to the Messiah, but to a state or condition which each Mason can attain. Three more terms. Cosmic Consciousness, Christ Consciousness, and Possession of the Lost Word. All three terms imply that the individual has attained the same state, the Christ state, wherein he has worked out his own salvation. We already know that the meaning of the symbol of the legend of the third degree is that the Mason has been redeemed from the death of sin. We shall see that the possession of the lost word is the key to the Masonic plan of salvation. This is page 49 in Clymer's The Mysticism of Masonry. He writes, After the candidate is obligated and brought to light in the third degree, he is bantered with the statement that undoubtedly he now imagines himself a master mason. He is informed not only that such is not the case, but there is no certainty that he will ever become such. He subsequently starts on his journey for the discovery of the lost word. On page 55, Clymer writes, Every man who takes upon himself the Masonic obligation can, if he will, find this lost word. The material required in the process of transmutation is within himself as surely as a man who has his cellar filled with coal and a furnace wherein to burn it has all that is required to start a roaring fire which will heat his house. Finding the lost word is an individual work. Each soul must accomplish it or miss immortality, and this is true whether a man be a churchman or a mason or both. As Ancient Mysteries in Modern Masonry by the Reverend Charles H. Vail. Here's the title page, and we see that Vail was the pastor of Pullman Memorial Church at Albion, New York. This book was published in 1909, and it was published by McCoy, the leading Masonic publisher. Here is a photograph of the Reverend Vail. Vail writes on page 211, 
The symbol of the lost word and the legend for the search of it embodies the whole design of Freemasonry. The primary object of Freemasonry is the search after divine truth. The word is a symbol of this divine truth, and this truth is the key to the science of the soul. Manley Palmer Hall wrote about the lost word in the lost keys of Freemasonry. This is page 59. He writes, The word is found when the master himself is ordained by the living hand of God, cleansed by living water, baptized by living fire, a priest king after the order of Melchizedek, who is above the law. This is another way of stating that the master mason becomes a Christ when the lost word is found. The Melchizedek priesthood is the priesthood of Jesus Christ. This drawing is between pages 52 and 53 of the Lost Keys of Freemasonry. The caption under it reads, In this picture is concealed the allegory of the lost word. The master mason becomes the capstone of the universal temple. Let's take a look at the drawing. The master mason becomes the capstone of the universal temple in the manner that Christ is the head of the church. How is the lost word found? That is the secret behind the secret doctrine. We have some more terminology to learn. Initiation, evolution, divine science, science of soul development, and soul architecture all refer to the same salvation process through which a mason reaches the Christ state. Initiation is the most commonly used word, but evolution is also used often. I will point out some of these words and phrases in the various texts when we run across them. Recall that possession of the lost word had the same meaning as having attained the Christ state. What is the significance of initiation? H.L. Haywood wrote about the significance of initiation in the chapter titled The Meaning of Initiation and Secrecy in the Great Teachings of Masonry. He writes on page 31, Masonic initiation is intended to be quite as profound and revolutionizing an experience. As a result of it, the candidate should become a new man. He should have a new range of thought, a new feeling about mankind, a new idea about God, a new confidence in immortality. His statement is quite accurate. After we have become fully aware of the secret doctrine, that statement will be understood to have a ponderous meaning. Again, we are being limited by our paradigms. We will come back to it. This is the bottom of page 85 of Mystic Masonry. Buck writes, Becoming perfect in humanity, man attains divinity. In other words, he becomes Christos. Remember that Christos is the Greek word for Christ. Now we'll go to the top of the next page. This is the meaning, aim, and consummation of human evolution. And this philosophy defines the one only process by which it may be attained. The perfect man is Christ, and Christ is God. This is the birthright and destiny of every human soul. Notice that evolution, a term which was previously defined, does indeed refer to the process by which a man is said to become a Christ. Masonry teaches that each man can become Christ and therefore God. Did you ever wonder where the Mormons got the idea that they could become gods? Well, Joseph Smith was a Mason. Now, some Masons would like to claim that this is uh, just Buck's personal opinion, that it is not uh, Masonic doctrine accurately, and that uh, no leading Masonic authority would put forth such an idea. But let me show you something in the Kentucky Monitor. This is the preface to the Kentucky Monitor, The Spirit of Masonry, page XX. And we notice down close to the bottom, God becomes man that man may become God. So it is accurate Masonic teaching that man may become God. That's the monitor which is used in the state of Kentucky. It's given to each and every man that's raised to Master Mason there. This is page 86 of Mystic Masonry in the center. And Buck writes, all real initiation is an internal, not an external process. It is thus that man must work out his own salvation. The consummation of initiation is the perfect master, the Christos, for these are the same. They are the goal, the perfect consummation of human evolution. 
In this passage, we see that initiation is also used to define the process of becoming a Christ. This is the Masonic initiation. The discipline of initiation is discussed in detail in the Masonic initiation, which was written by W. L. Wilmshurst. This is page 17. And Wilmshurst writes, It may be a surprise to some members of our craft to be told that our ceremonial rites, as at present performed, do not constitute or confer real initiation at all in the original sense of admitting a man to the solemn mysteries of the human soul and to practical experience in divine science. We profess to confer initiation, but few Masons know what real initiation involves. Very few, one fears, would have the wish, the courage, or the willingness to make the necessary sacrifices to attain it if they did. The meaning of the last sentence in the above quote is profound. We will come back to it also. This is page 19 of the meaning of initiation. Wilmhurst continues, For real initiation means an expansion of consciousness from the human to the divine level. This is Ancient Mysteries in Modern Masonry, page 141. The chapter is titled The Meaning of True Initiation. Vale writes, Thus studying the inner teachings of the mysteries, we see that Christ is not a unique personage, but the first fruits, the promise of man made perfect, the initiate has ever been thus regarded, for to attain the Christ state is salvation. Further down we read, Every man is a potential Christ, and the purpose of evolution is to raise every human being to the sublime degree of a master Christ. How would a Mason go about becoming a Christ? What is the technique of initiation? The Masonic Initiation by W. L. Wilmshurst contains a clue. This is page 45. For those upon the path to real initiation, meditation is essential. We run into the term soul architecture in the writings of Wilmshurst. He uses it to embody initiation repeated over time. Initiation always occurs when the physical body is in a state of trance or sleep and when the temporarily liberated consciousness has been transferred to a higher level. Further down on the page he writes, Yet in the actual experience of soul architecture, initiation succeeds initiation upon increasingly higher levels of the latter as the individual becomes correspondingly ripe for them, able to bear their strain and assimilate their revelations. This is page 54 of the Masonic Initiation. Initiation has no other end than this, conscious union between the individual soul and the universal divine spirit. So we can summarize the initiation process at this point. Initiation is a process in which a Mason goes into trance by passive meditation and attains conscious union. That is, he establishes communications with the Masonic God. By attaining conscious union, he becomes a Christ. The process of initiation reoccurs over months and years, and after each conscious union with the Masonic God, he has new understandings about himself and about the God. The process is evolutionary. The Mason evolves into a God himself. One Mason I talked to told me that Masonic initiation wasn't taught in this country. Of course, there is no way that a Mason would admit to this unless he was going to repent. Is Masonic initiation known in the United States? Well, all of the authors we have consulted on the subject are Americans, except for Wilmshurst. He was English. Let's take a look at an official publication of the Scottish Rite. Recently, they changed the name to the Scottish Rite Journal because of all the exposure the New Age was receiving. This is the title page for the October 1981 issue of the New Age. And if we look down further at the bottom of the page, we'll see that it is an official publication of the Supreme Council 33rd Degree Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry of the Southern Jurisdiction. So clearly this is an official publication. And on page 30, there's an article on initiation. 
This is the beginning of the article, which begins on page 30. Initiation, one step towards infinity. The initiate no doubt experienced an elevation of consciousness which profoundly affected modes of thought, word, and deed in his life. It was more likely akin to the born-again experience of evangelical Christianity, but of a more universal, cosmic nature. Notice that they talk about an elevation of consciousness, a, a born-again experience, but of a cosmic nature. If we were not familiar with some of the terminology of the secret doctrine, we wouldn't have any idea what they are talking about. But to those who are aware, the meaning is clear. Many Masonic writings have things going on on, a, on different levels, and only those that are aware of the doctrines understand. This is the altar in the House of the Temple in Washington. Notice that initiation is carved in the floor. It's also carved in the walls near the ceiling. Some of the snakes which adorn the House of the Temple can be seen at the top of the photograph. This book, Ancient Operative Masonry, has a statement on the Masonic teachings concerning Christ, which is about as clear as any I've seen. This was written by S.R. Parchment. It's being used only as a supporting document here. No new information is added. Parchment was both a Mason and a Rosicrucian. We will later see that there is a close relationship between Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism. The text that we're interested in is on page 35. But I wanted to show you that this was ancient operative masonry. The title is on the top of page 34. So we just swing over to page 35 here. Chapter heading is Egyptian masonry here. We read, The lost word is the Christ within to which the mystic mason looks for redemption. Further down on the page, In the early church, as in the secret doctrine, there was not a personal Christ for the whole world, but a potential Christ in every living being. Yea, the mystic, while investigating the intangible realms, beholds potential Christ in the atoms which compose the universe. Hence, Masons believe in the architect of the universe, but positively not in Jesus the man as the only Son of God. I think Parchment says it about as clearly as anyone. I'd like to summarize the secret doctrine at this time. There is not one Christ for the whole world, but a potential Christ in each man. It is far more important to become a Christ than it is to believe that Jesus was a Christ. Each man works out his own salvation by becoming his own savior. If a man doesn't save himself, he won't be saved. Since each man can become a Christ himself, they have no use for the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. This summarizes the actual process of salvation. Through the process of Masonic initiation, man may attain conscious union with the God of Freemasonry. The process of Masonic initiation is not a ceremony, but is an internal process which occurs while the individual is in trance. When conscious union is attained, the lost word is found. The man becomes a Christ and thus becomes a God himself. What is the true nature of the Masonic Lodge? What type of organization is it? I've asked this question several times before, and I imagine your opinion is changing as time goes on. I've hesitated to call Masonry a religion because most Masons will hotly deny it. We are going to look at some of what the Masonic authors have to say about the nature of the Lodge. This is Morals and Dogma. It, of course, was written by Albert Pike and published by the authority of the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree. We'll take a look at what he says about Freemasonry and the nature of it. Pike writes on page 213, Every Masonic Lodge is a temple of religion, and its teachings are instruction in religion. Certainly the material we've been looking at is instruction in religion. This is a comprehensive view of Freemasonry by Henry Wilson Coyle, 33rd degree. Coyle is a highly respected Mason. He wrote this book, and he also wrote uh, Coyle's Masonic Encyclopedia. So he is a, a well-recognized authority. 
the portrait of Coyle, which appears on the back cover of the book, it also notes that he's an attorney or was an attorney. Here's the title page. We notice that he's the chairman of the Committee on Masonic Information for the Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons of California. Looking down at the bottom, we notice that McCoy Publishing and Masonic Supply uh, publishes this book. And they're the leading Masonic publisher. Let's see what Coyle's opinion about uh, Masonry as a religion is. He says to call Masonry not religion, but religious, merely substitutes an adjective for a noun, both meaning the same thing. It is ab absurd as saying that a certain individual has no intellect, but is intellectual, or that he has no wealth, but is wealthy. Conversations on Freemasonry is another book that Henry Wilson Coyle wrote. And we can see down at the bottom that it also was published by McCoy Publishing and Masonic Supply Company. This is the beginning of chapter 5. It starts on page 163. And Coyle writes, Masonic writers have differed. Mackey called Freemasonry a religion. Pike dissented. Pike argued that one could not hold two religions at the same time, and hence a Christian, a Jew, or a Mohammedan who retained his religion could not accept Masonry also as a religion. Therefore, he said, Masonry could not be a religion. Well, that's rather absurd logic. Who is the God of Freemasonry? How can we be sure of his true identity? Let's take a look at the Kentucky Monitor. This is page 116. They have some text on the all-seeing eye, which is the eye of Osiris. In most of the ancient languages of Asia, eye and sun are expressed by the same word. And the ancient Egyptians hieroglyphically represented their principal deity, the sun god Osiris, by the figure of an open eye. In like manner, Masons have emblematically represented the omnipotence of the great architect of the universe. This is Mackey's revised encyclopedia. It's one of the most popular Masonic encyclopedias ever written. Mackey is one of the most widely respected Masonic authorities. There are various editions of this encyclopedia, and the page numbers are different in the various versions. So if you look up some of the material, go by the alphabetical listing of the topics rather than the page number. Here's the title page, Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, and it is in fact written by Albert G. Mackey. Here's a portrait of Mackey, so you can get an idea what he looked like. This is the article on Bell, which appears on page 130 of this particular edition of Mackey's uh, Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. Bell, spelled B-E-L, is usually pronounced Bell, but both Strong in his Hebrew dictionary and Feriabend in his prefer to say Baal. The word is probably the contracted form of some other Hebrew word, commonly pronounced Baal and spelled B-A-A-L. And he was worshipped by the Babylonians as their chief deity. At the top of the next column, we read that Baal signifies Lord or Master. Alone, the word applies to the sun god. With Ja and On, it has been introduced into the royal arts system as a representative of the, of the Tetragrammaton. In the royal arts degree, that's part of the York Rite, the secret name of God is supposedly revealed. It is Jebulon. Ja stands for Jehovah, Bull stands for Baal, and On is a corruption of Osiris. The god of the Masonic Lodge is identified with Baal and Osiris. Yahweh, the god of the Bible, would not be pleased to be associated with them. We see that Masonry apparently worships several gods. Osiris and Baal are among them. There is one god which they refuse to worship, and that is Jesus. I'm going to show you some text on page 65 of the Lost Keys of Freemasonry by Manley Palmer Hall. Hall writes, The true Mason is not creed-bound. He realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that as a Mason his religion must be universal. Christ, Buddha, or Mohammed 
The name means little, for he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. He worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in temple, mosque, or cathedral, realizing with his truer understanding the oneness of all spiritual truth. So we see that the true Mason is an idolater. He worships any god at any altar. We can be certain that the God which Masons have conscious union with is not God the Father because of what Jesus said. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Paul wrote this to the Corinthians, but to us there is but one God, the Father, and whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Now it is clear that Masons do not attain conscious union with their God through Jesus, because they deny that he is the one true Christ. From the writings of John, we can be certain that the God of the Bible is not the Masonic God. This is one of the scriptural definitions for Antichrist. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. John tells us that he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ is Antichrist. Masonry teaches that Jesus was born an ordinary man and that he became a Christ later on. He did not come as Christ in the flesh. Let's take a look at the meaning of Masonry by Lynn Perkins. Page 53, the beginning of chapter 5, which is titled Hiram, Christic Hero of Masonry. We read, Jesus of Nazareth had attained a level of consciousness of perfection that has been called by various names, cosmic consciousness, soul regeneration, philosophic initiation, spiritual illumination, Brahmic splendor, Christ consciousness. Notice that Perkins maintains that Jesus attained a level of consciousness, Christ consciousness. He was not born a Christ, he became a Christ later on. The Christ state is something he attained. We know from the writings of John that the spirit of masonry is antichrist. John wrote, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is it in the world. John also wrote, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So according to the biblical definition of antichrist, the spirit of masonry is antichrist. Is there anything in Masonic writings which would lead us to believe that Satan or Lucifer is the god of Freemasonry? We will fully answer that question in part two with an in-depth look at Masonic writings regarding that issue. Or is the god of Masonry? We're going to look at what Masonic writers say about the god of Freemasonry. This book is Ancient Mysteries in Modern Masonry by the Reverend Charles H. Vale. We saw this book in part one, and we're going to take a look at some of the other things that are in it. This is page 26, and we're going to look at text that's further down on the page. And it reads, In all of the initiations and mysteries, the gods exhibit many forms of themselves and appear in a variety of shapes, and sometimes, indeed, a formless light of themselves is held forth to the view. Sometimes this light is according to a human form, and sometimes it proceeds into a different shape. Notice that Vale, who is quoting Taylor, states that the gods sometimes appear as a formless light. 
Before we take a look at the writings of Swinburne Clymer, we need to know something about Manicheans. This is from Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. Manicheans, also termed Gnostics, it's a sect taking its rise in the middle of the third century whose belief was in two eternal principles of good and evil. They derive their name from Manus. Now Manus is spelled several different ways in the literature of Freemasonry. I want you to notice that they believed in two eternal principles of good and evil. These forces were said to be constantly opposed to one another. Their god or gods had two natures. One nature was good, the other nature was evil. We're going to take a look at the writings of Swinburne Clymer. This is the mysticism of masonry. And we can see that it's written by R. Swinburne Clymer, M.D. Manasis, spelled M-A-N-I-S-I-S, -I -S, was the leader of a sect of Gnostics who were known as Manicheans, according to Albert Pike. This is on page 565. Now, Swinburne Clymer wrote in The Mysticism of Masonry on page 19, The mysteries have now, as throughout the long ages past, for their foundation, the existence of God as Jehovah Adonai, the Father of Light. We've moved to page 52 of The Mysticism of Masonry. And Clymer writes, This Jehovah was the avenging side of the Creator and is not the Jehovah Adonai, the Father of Light of the New Age, who is also the Father of the multitudes and the God of Manasseh. Further down the page, he writes, Jehovah, the jealous God. The B God of the Bible is a jealous God. This is page 29 of the Mysticism of Masonry by Clymer. And Clymer writes, And Jehovah Adonai, that is to say, the Father of Light, spoke unto his messenger Manasseh, saying, I will appear to thee in the image of light, for did I not promise those who have gone before thee that the woman clothed with the sun should be with them? And I now establish a covenant with thee, and bind my laws to a fulfillment of this covenant, that all of my children who will obey the laws shall be blessed and cheered when in misfortune or sorrow. For I shall appear to them in the fire as an angel of light. It is clear from the writings of Vale and Clymer that the God of Masonry appears as a formless light or as an angel of light. This is not a direct admission that Lucifer is the God of the Lodge. However, let's see how Paul would interpret these Masonic writings. Paul warned us that Satan could appear as an angel of light. And he wrote to the Corinthians, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. This booklet is called The House of the Temple of the Supreme Council. It's a booklet that shows a lot about the, uh, the building where the 33rd degree uh, right is uh, conferred in, in Washington, D.C. And I want to show you a little bit about uh, Albert Pike in it. This is what's known as the Albert Pike Room. And I'm going to read the text that's at the right on the next page in the booklet. It says, Lawyer, linguist, teacher, scholar, frontiersman, editor, journalist, nationally known poet, internationally known philosopher, a mind of almost unimaginable intellectual scope, a man of unlimited compassion, illustrious brother Albert Pike, Grand Commander of the Mother Jurisdiction from 1859 to 1891 is remembered and honored in this room. Brother Pike used his vast talents to research and write the rituals, making them eloquent, symbolic representations of our rites history and philosophy. A number of his handwritten manuscripts and the quill pen he fashioned himself are on display in the Pike Room. Also on display is a miniature model of a monument honoring, honoring Grand Commander Pike. The original life-size monument is located on Indiana Avenue Northwest in Washington, D.C., between the Municipal Center and the Department of Labor Building. Albert Pike remains today an inspiration for Masons everywhere. His great book, Morals and Dogma, 
endures as the most complete ex exposition of Scottish Rite philosophy. He will always be remembered and revered as the master builder of the Scottish Rite. Now, Morals and Dogma has been previously mentioned. It was written by Albert Pike and published by the Supreme Council of the 33rd Degree. Remember that Pike's book, Morals and Dogma, is considered to be the apex of the teachings of the Scottish Rite, according to Fred Kleinkinect, the present Sovereign Grand Commander. Now we notice further down the page that this is an esoteric book, it means hidden knowledge, and it's a book that the Masons would like to make sure doesn't get into the wrong hands. Here is a portrait of Albert Pike. He died in 1891 and was buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Later, following an act of Congress, his body was moved to a tomb in the House of the Temple where the 33rd degree is conferred. Now Pike writes on page 741 that masonry is a search after light. Just about every mason knows that. Pike reveals the source of Masonic light on page 321. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light and with its splendors intolerable blinds feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not, for traditions are full of divine revelations and inspirations. Pike clearly reveals that Lucifer bears the light of Freemasonry. I want to remind you that this book is the apex of the teachings of the Scottish Rite. Here is the November 1990 issue of the Scottish Rite Journal. This is the house organ of the Supreme Council of the Southern Jurisdiction. This is the title page of the November 1990 issue. And we'll look down at the bottom and we notice on page 22 that there's an article about Manley Palmer Hall. This is the article that begins on page 22, and it turns out that it's the, the obituary for Manley Palmer Hall. And it reads, Illustrious Manley Palmer Hall, often called Masonry's greatest philosopher, and he departed his earthly labors peacefully in his sleep on August 7, 1990. Further down the page we read, he is best known for writing The Lost Keys of Freemasonry in 1923, and, of course, his monumental encyclopedic outline of Masonic history, philosophy, and related subjects. Now, we notice that he received the Scottish Rite's highest honor, the Grand Cross, in 1985 because of his exceptional contributions to Freemasonry, the Scottish Rite, and the public good. Like Grand Commander Albert Pike before him, Illustrious Hall did not teach a new doctrine but was an ambassador of an ageless tradition of wisdom that enriches us to this day. The world is a far better place because of Manly Palmer Hall, and we are better persons for having known him and his work. This is a glowing tribute to Hall. They've lifted up four of his 50 books. We're going to look at two of the four. With an obituary like that, anything Manly Palmer Hall wrote in those books is endorsed by the Scottish Rite. We will recognize that what Hall wrote agrees with other Masonic writers such as Pike, and indeed it is an ageless wisdom. This is the catalog cut in McCoy's catalog, McCoy Publishing and Masonic Supply Company. They are the leading Masonic publisher. Take a look at how they advertise the Lost Keys of Freemasonry. It's a book for the Mason and non-Mason, revealing the profounder aspects of an ancient fraternity which is always wrought for the benefit of mankind. And this book is one to be read over and over again. This is the title page for the Lost Keys of Freemasonry. And if we look down at the bottom, we see that, in fact, it is published by McCoy Publishing and Masonic Supply Company. Now, on page 48, we find some of the ageless wisdom of Freemasonry. When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy. 
This is from page 42 of the Masonic Textbook of West Virginia. I want you to notice the star in the center of the carpet. How many points are up or pointing up? Two. On the facing page, page 43, we find that the blazing star is an emblem of deity. So this star with two points up represents the Masonic God. This is the entrance to the Grand Lodge of Indiana. Notice the star on the left. Here's a close-up of that star. This particular version of the star represents the Masonic organization for the female relatives of Masons. The organization is known as the Eastern Star. Notice the five letters in the center, F-A-T-A-L, fatal. The Eastern Star is always shown with two points up. This is the title page for the ritual book of the Eastern Star. We can look a little further down and we'll see that it was arranged by Robert McCoy and it's published by McCoy Publishing and Masonic Supply Company. It's a 1943 copy. On page 11, they talk about the objects of the rite or the purpose for its existence. It's for inciting the influence of females towards the purposes of the Masonic institution. The emblem of the Eastern Star is a five-pointed star with two points up. And we see these words, I have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. This is a phrase that's used to identify those members who are entitled to participate in its rituals. Now when you hear a phrase like, I've seen his star in the east and I've come to worship him, the first question that comes to mind is, whose star is it? Well, you might think it's the star of Bethlehem, but if you'll remember, the wise men came from the east and they were following a star which would have had to appear in the western sky. So it would have been a western star. So clearly the eastern star can't be the star of Bethlehem. We're going to look at multiple Masonic sources to find out whose star it really is. Remember Manley Palmer Hall's obituary? They mentioned that he had written over 50 books and they lifted up four of them. And I told you that we would look at two of them. The first one we looked at was the Lost Keys of Freemasonry. The second one we're going to look at is an encyclopedic outline of Masonic, Hermetic, Kabbalistic, and Rosicrucian symbolical philosophy. It also goes by another title, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. This is the hardback version of the uh, book, and it's got the secret teachings of all ages on the spine. This is the paperback version, and it goes by the title, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. This is a large book. It's about 14 or 15 inches high. Here's the title page. We notice that it is written by Manley Palmer Hall. Clearly, this is the book they're referring to in the obituary. This is a portrait of Manley Palmer Hall as he looked in his younger years. This is page CIV of Hall's book. This is the full page. We're going to look in the lower right-hand corner with a close-up. Manley Palmer Hall, Masonry's greatest philosopher, reveals the secret behind the five-pointed star. When used in black magic, the pentagram is called the sign of the cloven hoof, or the footprint of the devil. The star with two points upward is also called the goat of Mendez, because the inverted star is the same shape as the goat's head. When the upper star turns and the upper point falls to the bottom, it signifies the fall of the morning star. Here is a drawing of the goat of Mendez, who is also known as Baphomet. This is found on page CI of Hall's book. This is the back cover of a book written by Aleister Crowley. Notice the symbol to the left of the word Baphomet. That's known as the seagull of Baphomet. This is the signature of C. Fred Kleinconnect which is found in the November 1990 issue of the Scottish Rite Journal. You notice that he affixes the seagull of Baphomet to the left of his name. This is a portrait of Fred Klein Connect, which is in a bridge to light. 
You notice that he also has the seagull of Baphomet on his hat piece. Recently in Masonic publications, they've been trying to deny that the, the seagull of Baphomet was really the seagull of Baphomet. What they claim it is is the cross of Salem. But this is a copy of, uh, a Xerox copy of a book that's published by Llewellyn Publications. They're a leading publisher of occult material. And we can see that they refer to this symbol as the seagull of Baphomet. It's well known in occult literature that this is, in fact, the seagull of Baphomet. This book is a history of Freemasonry and concordant orders. It was written just before the turn of the century. Here's the title page. We notice again its history of the ancient and honorable fraternity of free and accepted Masons and concordant orders. And we notice it's written by a board of editors and a man named William James Hunan is listed second there as a European editor. He's the man that I mentioned you should remember in the West Virginia Monitor. And at the bottom we can see that it's dated 1891. This book also contains information about the secret of the Eastern Star. This is page 101. And we read, when the pentagram elevates two of its points, it represents Satan, or the goat of the mysteries. And when it elevates one of its points only, it represents the Savior, goodness, virtue. Another entry in the same book states it slightly differently. This is on page 49. This star represents God, all that is pure, virtuous, and good, when represented with one point upward. But when turned with one point down, it represents evil, all that is opposed to the good, pure, and virtuous. In fine, it represents the goat of Mendez. So when the ladies at the Eastern Star are saying, I have seen his star in the East and I've come to worship him, what they're really saying is that they're attending the Eastern Star meetings to worship Satan. Is there any direct evidence from Masonic literature that they would provide information or instruction to conjure Satan or his demons? This book is The Builders. It was written by Joseph Fort Newton in 1914. It's the classic which today is often presented to newly raised Master Masons. The bibliography contains references to most of the major books and authors which reveal the hidden meanings behind Masonry. This is page 57. It's a page in the chapter on the secret doctrine. We look down at the bottom of the page and it says, perhaps the greatest student in this field of esoteric teaching and method, certainly the greatest now living is Arthur Edward Waite, to whom it is a pleasure to pay tribute. Now it also says that Waite died in 1942. This book was written in 1914, so uh, that's why they say the greatest student now living. The tribute continues through page 61. Newton speaks of Waite's writings as a series of volumes, noble in form, united in aim, unique in wealth, and revealing beauty, and of unequaled worth. Waite, who until his death in 1945 was considered to be a great student of the secret doctrine, wrote this Masonic encyclopedia, a new encyclopedia of Freemasonry. Waite translated this book on transcendental magic. Waite also wrote The Book of Black Magic. On the title page, under his name, we find that he wrote a book entitled Devil Worship in France. On page 244 through 248 of The Book of Black Magic, we find detailed instructions on how to conjure Lucifer. I'm not going to read this. I'll leave it on the screen for a few seconds and let you read enough of it. This book was published by the authority of the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree. 
It has a bibliography listing selected references in the back. It's known as a bridge to light. Here's the title page. And we can see down at the bottom that it was, in fact, uh, written but with the authorization of the Supreme Council. And it's a fairly recent book, 1988. The foreword by, was by Fred Kleinconnect. We've already seen that. Here's the selected references, which are found on page 329 of A Bridge to Light. And we notice down at the bottom that they recommend Manley Palmer Hall's 1928 Secret Teachings of All Ages, an encyclopedic outline of Masonic, Hermetic, Kabbalistic, and Rosicrucian symbolical philosophy. Now, we've already seen this book, but it has some additional information about conjuring demons that I want to show you. This is a close-up of the top half of the title page of the Secret Teachings of All Ages. I just wanted to show you the, uh, or point out, the Rosicrucian word there. And I want you to notice the Rosicrucian connection. Masonic, Hermetic, Kabbalistic, and Rosicrucian symbological philosophy is the other title. This is the full page of the chapter heading on ceremonial magic and sorcery in Hall's book. I'm going to do a, a close-up of the, uh, the left-hand top of the page. Hall writes, Ceremonial magic is the ancient art of invoking and controlling spirits by a scientific application of certain formula. And down below he writes, while the elaborate ceremonial magic of antiquity was not necessarily evil. Well, believe me, what Hall is talking about here is conjuring demons, and it is extremely evil. On the right, we have page CIII. We're going to zoom in on the center of the left column and then the top portion of the right column. But the section heading here is modus operandi for the invocation of spirits. This is a rather nice way to say the methods to be used to conjure demons. This is the top right portion of the page. I'm not going to read this. I'll let, let you read it. Clearly, this is detailed instructions on how to conjure demons. It's a how-to book. Here is a drawing from the book showing a magician invoking a demon. Notice that he's standing in a magic circle. And on the upper left-hand corner, we've got Baphomet, the goat of Mendez. Notice the symbol that the demon is standing in. It's a circle with a triangle in it. Have you ever seen that emblem before? That's the symbol that's used for Alcoholics Anonymous. If you ever have the opportunity to get a hold of an Alcoholics Anonymous book, read their concept of God. I think you'll find it highly interesting. How would you go about controlling a demon once it was invoked? Well, the secret teachings of all ages provides an example pact, which is found on this page, CIV. I'm going to take a close-up of the lower left-hand corner, and then the text will continue on the top right corner. It reads, at last a pact is agreed upon. It may read as follows. I hereby promise the great spirit Lucifuge, prince of demons, that each year I will bring unto him a human soul to do with as it may please him. And in return, Lucifuge promises to bestow upon me the treasures of the earth and fulfill my every desire for the length of my natural life. If I fail to bring to him each year the offering specified above, then my own soul shall be forfeit to him. And it's signed, the infant signs the pact with his own blood. Now this next book is not a Masonic book, and I want to make that perfectly clear. This book is the Satanic Rituals. It's written by Anton Sanzor LaVey. He's the founder of the California-based Church of Satan. Notice the symbol that he uses on the front of the book. It's a five-pointed star with two points up, and it's got the goat's head superimposed in it. In the introduction to this book, LaVey writes, the rites in this book call the names of devils. He further writes, if one is truly good inside, he can call the names of the gods of the abyss with freedom from guilt and immunity from harm. 
the resultant feeling will be most gratifying, but there is no turning back. Now, I've not said that Freemasonry was satanic, but let's see what LaVey says about the satanic rituals. He says satanic ritual is a blend of Gnostic, Kabbalistic, Hermetic, and Masonic elements. Is there any common ground in the Rosicrucian and Masonic teachings which would give us a better understanding of the true nature of initiation? This is from Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. The heading is Rosicrucianism. And he says that many writers have sought to discover a close connection between the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons. And some, indeed, have advanced the theory that the latter are only the successors of the former. Whether this opinion be correct or not, there are sufficient coincidences of character between the two to render the history of Rosicrucianism highly interesting to the Masonic student. This is the mysticism of masonry by Swinburne Clymer. I said before that Clymer was both a Rosicrucian and a Mason. So let's see what he has to say. He writes that the Rosicrucians were the real leaven in all Masonic organizations. Many Masonic writers try to claim that the Rosicrucian order was started by Freemasonry. More About Masonry by H. L. Haywood contains the following on page 7. Haywood writes, There is no evidence that any society of Rosicrucianism was ever organized with that name until a Masonic side order was set up in England late in the 19th century. Is there anything in the literature which would lead us to believe that Masonic initiation is a method to communicate with demons? This next book, In the Proneos of the Temple of Wisdom, by Franz Hartmann, is not a Masonic book. This is from a Rosicrucian source. We are using it here because it is easy to understand, and we will see parallels between it and the next Masonic book. Both Rosicrucians and Masons are involved in initiation. The human soul may be put into a state of sleep so that she will forget her terrestrial conditions and turning her whole being towards her divine origin, she will become illuminated by the divine light and not only be able to see the future and to prophesy it correctly, but also to receive certain spiritual powers. On such occasions, the divine inspiration and illumination may be so great as even to communicate itself to other persons near and to in influence them in a similar manner. Persons in a state of receptivity or passivity, you could read that as the word trance, may become mediums through which divine demons, influences, may be attracted within the body of man and cause men to perform wonderful things. If the soul of such a person breaks away from the bonds of the body and surrenders herself to the power of imagination, she may become the habitation of demons of a lower order, which may enable her to perform extraordinarily things. Thus we may see that a person who has never had any instructions in painting may suddenly exercise that art and produce an artistic work, etc., etc., This book, Emergence of the Mystical, was written by Sovereign Grand Commander of the Scottish Rite, Henry C. Clausen. We can see that Henry Clausen indeed is, was the Sovereign Grand Commander of the Scottish Rite Supreme Council, the Mother Supreme Council of the World. This is a portrait of Clausen. Notice that he also wears the seagull of Baphomet. This is page 70 of Emergence of the Mystical. Notice how the supernatural abilities described in this Masonic book are similar to the Rosicrucian descriptions. For example, Jesse Shepard, a philosophic mystic who astounded witnesses with his musical performances, sang simultaneously bass and baritone, and gave speeches in Arabic, French, Latin, Greek, and, for the next page, Chaldean, when in trance. Charles Linton, a clerk with little education whose automatic writing was spectacular and who wrote a monumental book of 100,000 words in four months 
in a handwriting different than his own. Now the reason he was able to write it in a handwriting different than his own was because he wasn't really writing the book. The demon was writing the book through his body. This is an example of demon possession. And if you recall from the book of Acts, there was a slave girl who was following Paul around. She told the future and, and uh, she brought in her owners no small sum of money. And she was following Paul around telling the people that uh, this man is telling you about the one true God. And Paul got tired of it and cast the demon out of her. So clearly we have scriptural uh, evidence that uh, shows us that it is possible for a demon to provide spiritual gifts also. This is the Lost Keys of Freemasonry again, page 18. And we read, In Freemasonry is concealed the mystery of creation, the answer to the problem of existence, and the path a student must tread in order to join those who are really the living powers behind the thrones of modern national and international affairs. On page 57, Hall writes, The Master Mason, if he be truly a master, is in communication with the unseen powers that move the destinies of life. Well, what does the Bible say? Who is the unseen power which controls the world? We read from 1 John, We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Does the Bible support the conclusion that a method such as Masonic initiation would enable a Mason to communicate with demons? Paul wrote the following to Timothy. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now it is obvious that for anyone to give heed to seducing spirits and their doctrines, that the doctrines must be communicated from the seducing spirit to man. The Masonic doctrine that a Mason can become a Christ is not of God. It is clearly of Satan the Antichrist. Additional details of the secret doctrine are communicated to Masons by demons while they are in trance. This is page 87 of the Masonic Initiation. The passage we saw before from this book can be understood to agree with the realities as predicted in Scripture. Reading from the bottom of the page, yet in the actual experience of soul architecture, initiation succeeds initiation upon increasingly higher levels of the ladder as the individual becomes correspondingly ripe for them, able to bear their strain and assimilate their revelations. Let's compare the writings of Wilmshurst with Scripture. Yet in the actual experience of soul architecture, initiation succeeds initiation upon increasingly higher levels of the ladder as the individual becomes correspondingly ripe for them, able to bear their strain. Paul wrote to Timothy, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. The process of Masonic initiation is one in which the conscience of the individual is seared as with a hot iron. As his spirit is progressively deadened, he is able to bear more and more of the revelations. What is the expected result of Masonic initiation? This is from Ancient Mysteries in Modern Masonry, page 33. We read that Initiation, as we shall see in a subsequent lecture, was regeneration, a real spiritual new becoming or rebirth. The candidate himself became the thing symbolized, Hermes, Buddha, Christ, etc. This state was the result of real initiation, an evolution of the human into the divine. The initiate is reborn and has a new becoming. When a man becomes a Christian, he is reborn. Masonry has a similar born-again experience which will literally change a man's life. This is from the Masonic Initiation by Wilmshurst. True self-knowledge is unobstructed conscious union of the human spirit with God and the realization of their identity. In that identic union, the unreal, superficial selves have become obliterated. The sense of personality is lost. Man realizes with his own inherent ultimate divinity and thenceforth 
lives and acts no longer as a separate individual with an independent will, but in integration with the divine life and will whose instrument he becomes, whose purpose he thenceforth serves. Notice that the mason becomes unable to act as a separate individual and becomes an instrument of the Masonic God. This is from Ancient Mysteries in Modern Masonry by the Reverend Charles H. Vail. The consummation of all this was to make the initiate a god, either by union with the divine being without or by the realization of the divine self within. The initiate realizes the Masonic God within. He is demon-possessed. He is no longer able to act as a separate individual. He now is an instrument of the Masonic God. He has been filled with an unholy spirit. Drawing titled The Guardian of the Threshold is found in Manley Palmer Hall's book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. Just a few minutes ago, I showed you some material from the Satanic Rituals written by Anton Stanzler LeVay. And he said that if one was truly good inside, that he could invoke devils and they couldn't do any harm to him. Well, there's similar teaching in Masonic books. And this drawing depicts a person that's invoked a demon and he's able to stand up to the demon because he's, he's good. And we'll see uh, in just a moment in uh, a book by Buck uh, the same concept. This is Buck's book, Mystic Masonry, page 115. And he writes, in genuine initiations into the really occult mysteries, the penalties for unworthiness in any and all directions consisted in the apostate becoming the victim of the powers he had himself invoked. And he writes down further, Bulwer's demon of the threshold may be neither a joke nor a romance, as many cases of obsession recorded in the annals of medicine and spiritualism abundantly prove. We've seen this before. It's from the Great Teachings of Masonry, page 31. With a clear understanding of the secret doctrine, we're now able to understand the true meaning of this passage. Masonic initiation is intended to be quite profound and as revolutionizing an experience. As a result of it, the candidate should become a new man. He should have a new range of thought, a new feeling about mankind, a new idea about God, a new confidence in immortality. Demon possession can do all of that for a man. I've also seen this before. The statements at the bottom of this page are from the Masonic Initiation by W.L. Wilmshurst, and it's also seen to have a profound meaning at this time. We profess to confer initiation, but few Masons know what real initiation involves. Very few, one fears, would have the wish, the courage, or the willingness to make the necessary sacrifices to attain it if they did. Most Masons who are involved with initiation are unaware that they're dealing with demons. J.D. Buck accurately explains why in Mystic Masonry. This is page 59. How much one's idea of God colors all his thoughts and deeds is seldom realized. If your idea of God is not Jesus, you can't see things clearly. What is the purpose of the Masonic Lodge? This is page 186 of The Lost Word, Its Hidden Meaning by George Steinmetz. Steinmetz writes, It is our studied opinion that the objective of Freemasonry is the acquisition of spiritual cognition, that is, possession of the Master's Word is but another of the synonymous words or phrases for cosmic consciousness. This is from the Great Teachings of Masonry by H. L. Haywood. He writes the following, The fraternity itself exists in order to keep fixed on a man a certain set of influences and to bring about certain changes in the world, etc. Its secrecy is a means to that end and helps to make such a purpose possible. Now it is clear from an understanding of the secret doctrine and of scripture, the certain set of influences he is referring to are demons. What purpose does Satan have for putting masons in churches? Well, in order to keep fixed upon those churches a certain set of influences and in order to bring about certain changes in those churches. The secrecy surrounding masonry is a means to that end and helps to make such a purpose possible. 
This is from the Masonic Initiation by W.L. Elmshurst. It's on page 54. And he writes, Initiation has no other end than this, conscious union between the individual soul and the universal divine spirit. Wilmhurst writes on page 55, The whole purpose and end of initiation, the union of the personal soul with its divine principle, masonry has no other objective than this. All other matters of interest connected with it are but details subsidiary to this supreme achievement. This is page 19 of The Lost Keys of Freemasonry by Manley Palmer Hall. He writes that the Masonic Order is not a mere social organization, but is composed of all those who abandon themselves together to learn and apply the principles of mysticism and the occult rites. We can summarize the secret doctrine at this point. Through the process of Masonic initiation, man may attain conscious union with the God of Freemasonry. The process of Masonic initiation is not a ceremony, but is an internal process which occurs while the individual is in trance. When conscious union is attained, the lost word is found. The man becomes a Christ and thus becomes a God himself. There is not one Christ for the whole world, but a potential Christ in each man. It is far more important to become a Christ than it is to believe that Jesus was a Christ. Each man works out his own salvation by becoming his own savior. If a man doesn't save himself, he won't be saved. Since each man can become a Christ himself, they have no use for the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. Is the knowledge of the secret doctrine confined to only those men who have completed the higher degrees? No, that's a popular misconception. The secret doctrine is not confined to the higher degrees of masonry only. Nothing in the higher degrees reveals the secret doctrine explicitly. The secret doctrine is discovered by reading and reflection. Every master mason has access to the lodge library. In reality, only about 40% of masons are in any of the higher degrees. So it's highly likely that more master masons know about the secret doctrine than men who are in the higher degrees. Are there masons who are following Jesus in the Masonic Lodge? From a careful examination of the secret doctrine, we find no evidence that anyone in a position of authority or leadership in the Masonic Lodge is attempting to follow Jesus, and in fact they are attempting to lead those under them away from Jesus and into bondage. Now, it is true that many Masons have not read a single Masonic book. Is there anything in Masonic ritual which would allow a man to confirm that Freemasonry is incompatible with the teachings of Jesus? These two books are books that are commonly used by Masons. One is Duncan's Ritual on the left. The other one is Lester's Look to the East. They both contain the first three degrees of Masonry, the rituals. These are sold by Masonic suppliers. And in fact, I had these given to me by men who've renounced the lodge. Now, now, sometimes a mason will tell you that the ritual of the lodge has never been written down, and what's in those books doesn't really represent the ritual, and they're not accurate. Well, there are slight variations from state to state. For example, one state might say knowingly and willingly violate, where another would say knowingly violate. So there's a difference. And if this particular monitor was to list the uh, the ritual from the first state, then the guy from the second state could say, no, it doesn't accurately represent the ritual. So in a way, he's telling you the truth, but he's doing it with the purpose of trying to deceive you. Now, these books are essentially accurate, and uh, most Masons will admit it privately, but they won't uh, publicly. This is an oath that's taken in the entered apprentice, or first degree, and it's taken the first night that the man's in the lodge. It reads, All this I most solemnly and sincerely promise and swear, binding myself under no less penalty than that of having my throat cut across from ear to ear, my tongue torn out by its roots, and buried in the sands of the sea at low water mark, where the tide ebbs and flows twice in twenty-four hours, should I in the least knowingly or wittingly violate or transgress 
this, this my inner apprentice obligation. Now the worshipful master leads the man through this a few words at a time and he doesn't see what it is he's swearing to before he swears to it. This is the second degree obligation or oath. I most solemnly and sincerely promise and swear, binding myself under no less penalty than that of having my left breast torn open, my heart plucked from thence, and given to the beasts of the field and the birds of the air as a prey, should I, in the least, knowingly or wittingly violate or transgress this my fellow craft obligation. So help me God. This is the third degree or master mason ritual. All this I most solemnly, sincerely promise and swear, binding myself under no less penalty than that of having my body severed in two, my bowels taken from thence, and burned to ashes, the ashes scattered before the four winds of heaven, that no more remembrance might be had of so vile and wicked, and wicked a wretch as I would be, should I ever knowingly violate this my master mason's obligation. So help me God. Now we've seen the oaths that all master masons and entered apprentices and fellow crafts have to take. Every time they go through a ritual, they have to take another oath. What did Jesus say concerning oaths? In Matthew, we find the following. Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Some translations, NIV for one, says comes from the evil one, James also had something to say about oaths. James wrote, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. The Master Mason Oath also contains the following, Further, that I will always aid and assist all poor, distressed, worthy Master Masons, their widows and orphans, knowing them to be such, as far as their necessities may require, and my ability permit, without material injury to myself and family. Further, that I will keep a worthy brother Master Mason's secrets inviolable when communicated to me and received as such, murder and treason accepted. Now this could prevent a Mason from testifying truthfully concerning another Mason in a court of law. Masonic judges are obligated to do whatever they can to help a Masonic defendant out of difficulty if they know him to be a Mason. Mason's oath continues, Further, that I will not give the grand hailing sign of distress, except in the case of the most eminent danger, in a just and lawful lodge, or for the benefit of instruction, and if ever I should see it given or hear the words accompanying it by a worthy brother in distress, I will fly to his relief if there is a greater probability of saving his life than losing my own. Any Christian who joined the Masonic Lodge would become yoked with unbelievers. Is this a serious matter? I wrote to the Corinthians, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father to you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 
In verses 17 and 18 of the passage, we find a covenant. God promises that he will be a father to us and will be his sons and daughters if we remain separate and touch not the unclean thing. Can any Mason truly claim that he has remained separate? Can he claim to be a child of God based on this covenant? Truly say any Mason is a godly man? Consider the words of John. Whoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Can a man remain under the authority of the worshipful master of the lodge and have Jesus as the Lord and master of his life? Well, what did Jesus say? He said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Clearly, we can see from just the two issues of taking oaths and yoking with unbelievers that no one in the Masonic Lodge is following Jesus. Will the Christian Mason have salvation? This is the Masonic Monitor for the state of Nebraska. We can see on the title page that this is published by the Order of the Grand Lodge. And if we look down at the bottom, we notice it's a 1923 copy. Now each Mason is presented with a lambskin apron. And we read on page 18 of this Masonic Monitor. My brother, I now present you with a lambskin or white leather apron. It is an emblem of innocence and the badge of a mason. When you stand before the great white throne, may, be, may it be your portion to hear from him who sitteth as a judge supreme the welcome words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. That same passage is found in the monitors of Florida, Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, and many others. The Lodge tells the men that they're going to stand before the Great White Throne. The Great White Throne is the judgment of the dam that's found in Revelation chapter 20. The Lodge is telling them that they're going to hell, but it does it in a way that they don't understand what they're being told. Well, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Masons worship a God referred to as the great architect of the universe. The great architect is Satan or Lucifer. Masons are idolaters, all of them. The rituals for the first three degrees constitute witchcraft. What did Paul say concerning idolatry and witchcraft? Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Most of the men in, who enter the lodge are deceived. Is being deceived an excuse acceptable to God? Consider the words of Paul. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. After the truth is revealed, can any man remain in the lodge and abide in Jesus? What did John say? This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. John also wrote, And hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. 
What are the prospects for a man who is willing to confess the sins of masonry, renounce the oaths, and repent of his involvement in the lodge? This is from 1 John. John wrote, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. John also wrote, And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Can a man be released from Masonic oaths which were supposedly taken unto God? Virtually all men entering the lodge took the oaths before they knew what it is that they were swearing to keep secret. Consider the following scripture. It's from Leviticus. Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him, when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. And it shall be, when he shall be guilty in one of these, that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin, which he hath sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb, or a kid of the goats, for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. This scripture applies directly to Masonic oaths. Now we see in Hebrews chapter 5, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Masonic oaths are a sin and must be confessed as sin. The sacrifice God demands for a sin offering is a lamb. Each repenting mason must go to the priest, and the priest shall make atonement for him. The lamb has been provided by God. He is without spot or blemish. His name is Jesus, and he was put to death as an offering for the sins of the world. He is also the high priest to whom we must go to confess our sins. Masonic oaths are not binding after they are confessed as sin, and all involvement with masonry is severed. The following are my conclusions. First of all, Freemasonry is a religion. Number two, the god of Freemasonry, known as the great architect of the universe, is Satan or Lucifer. Number three, Freemasonry has a secret doctrine which is well documented in Masonic literature. Number four, the secret doctrine of Freemasonry denies the unique deity of Jesus Christ. Number five, the secret doctrine contains a false plan of salvation wherein each Mason earns his own salvation by attaining conscious union with the deceiving spirit. Number six, the secret doctrine of Freemasonry teaches that each Mason can evolve into a Christ and therefore a God. Number seven, the secret doctrine of Freemasonry constitutes a false gospel and is therefore condemned according to Galatians chapter six, verses one through nine. Number eight, a man cannot accept both the gospel of Jesus Christ as documented in the Bible and the secret doctrine of Freemasonry at the same time. Number nine, involvement of a Christian man in Freemasonry would be inconsistent with the teachings of Jesus Christ even if he were unaware of the secret doctrine. 
Number 10, a Christian cannot be involved in masonry without yoking with unbelievers. A Christian mason would not be considered to be one of the sons of God under the covenant found in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. Number 11, the religion of Freemasonry constitutes witchcraft. Number 12, participating in the worship of the great architect of the universe through Masonic rituals constitutes idolatry. Number 13, involvement of any Christian in idolatry or witchcraft places his salvation in question, according to Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Number 14, a man cannot be a knowledgeable Christian and a knowledgeable mason at the same time. Number 15. A congregation which is knowledgeable about masonry cannot allow anyone involved in the fellowship to remain a mason without deviating from the teachings of Jesus Christ and his apostles. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and 2 John are relevant scriptures. If we know the truth about Freemasonry and we choose to do nothing, then we ourselves fall into sin.